Uh, so I'm Jason Oliver with the Cornell Pro Dairy Dairy Environmental environmental systems team, and I'm going to talk about some mitigation options for air quality impacts and really kind of focus on um, dairy and sort of a Northeast perspective. So we'll start off overviewing some of the impacts that dare, uh, dairy production does have on air quality. Uh, then I'll talk about some farmstead improvements that can, uh, I think, do a lot with odor and, and dust and then focus in on some of the manure systems um, and talk about uh, strategies to manage uh, emissions related to pits, talk about a couple of the treatment technologies on farms, uh, solid liquid separation, anaerobic digestion, cover and flare systems for manure storages, and then touch on, on biofilters as well. Um, we have several ongoing projects looking at emissions um, in New York, really kind of a greenhouse gas focus lately, um, but we're, we're busy in this area. Um, I do want to start um, kind of setting the tone a little bit. Um, so agricultural production is, is really changed in the last few decades, um, but so is the way uh, that we are sort of living on the land. And so on the left-hand side, you'll see an image of a, actually a swine facility out in Minnesota, where I did some of my um, PhD work. And you can see both a, a very large CAFO, but then across the road, a, a quite large um, housing development. Um, we're seeing that same kind of thing in dairy in the Northeast, where we've, we've had farms expand to many thousands of cows and um, basically encroachment of urban areas into areas that were traditionally farmland. And I think with that, you have um, maybe, uh, in an, especially with odor, um, you've, you've got folks exposed to sort of the smells of farms that never were before and this kind of heightened awareness of what's going on on the farm and how it's impacting me. And I think that's, um, you know, leading potentially to some, some challenges for, for folks in our field. Um, so not picking on this farm or any farm, but, you know, as these as these farms have gotten um, more consolidated, there basically are new and, and I would say larger emission sources. Um, so this is a picture I took pretty recently from from field work. And if I were to highlight some things, you know, we've got large open pits of manure um, areas where that manure is basically spilling in. Um, you've got large feeding centers and tanks with fertilizers that are all sources of, of emissions. Um, we've got flares and anaerobic digesters and manure pits and large pumps. Um, we even have stacks affiliated with some of the, you know, engine generator sets. Um, and then, of course, you know, large barn facilities. And all these are, um, you know, have an impact on air quality both I would say locally and, and regionally. So again, ammonia is a big player here and I do think we're gonna start to hear more about it. Um, and ammonia can have some impacts both on respiratory health um, for humans and workers, neighbors, um, but it also can impact uh, the cows, right? And it can lower um, her milk production pretty substantially. Um, there's also some environmental impacts, eutrophication, acidification of, of water, um, and then I, it can lead to some smog issues, especially as it interacts with um, uh, it, and becomes particulate matter. Uh, we also have odor issues associated um, with these facilities, and then some VOCs can lead to the formation of ground level ozone. Up in these red boxes are just some of the kind of main sources on a farm. So Many are manure and manure storage related. Um, some are related to silage and, and total mixed rations, and others are just due to farm equipment and cattle locomotion. Um, so, in a dry lot setting, you can really think of cows kicking up dust. But I, you know, inside of our um, modern dairy facilities in the Northeast, I still see a lot of dusty curtains and, and dusty rafters. Um, then, of course, greenhouse gases, right? The big, the big elephant in the room, and uh, we're getting a lot of attention um, in the cattle world for our um, emission of methane. Uh, most of that is enteric, um, but we also have uh, increased emissions due to storage of manure and anaerobic ways. Um, there are carbon dioxide impacts. Uh, those tend to be really fossil fuel driven. You know, we think of cows eating grass as part of this biogenic carbon cycle, and 
we don't really account for animal respiration due to that. Um, and then there's the field piece, which I won't touch on much here, but that really tends to be where nitrous oxide comes in. Um, although some manure storages, especially with really thick crust, are known to generate nitrous oxide. Um, I also like to note that even though our agricultural systems get a lot of heat for our impact on greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we're really a, a pretty minor player when you look at national or state level emissions. Um, and in New York, cattle, you know, dairy production is only about 4% of our, um, you know, so the state's sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, while we're a small percentage, I also think we have a, a big opportunity to, to plan mitigation options um, through the way we manage manure, opportunities to sequester carbon, um, you know, the, the diverse forest lands that some of our farms in the Northeast have. Uh, one other emission that um, is worth mentioning is bioaerosols. So these are essentially bacteria, fungi, um, they're, they're products that can be, you know, aerosolized and, and, and move. Um, some of them are, are obviously pathogens, including um, the causal agent of farmer's lung, um, which can be, you know, is, is not common, but can be a deadly disease. Um, there has been some work in, uh, by the ARS, mostly in, in the Midwestern and Western states, and they do find that you know, dairy freestall barns can be a, a source of bioaerosols, but generally a few hundred meters downwind, um, they're not seeing any elevated levels. Um, the image I'm showing you here is from some work looking at manure application and the um, dispersion of bioaerosols. Um, they were really focused on, you know, things like E. coli, um, maybe less of a concern from a respiratory perspective, but could be of concern to say a, a neighbor who's growing cabbage Right. And so there are some rules about how close you can apply manure to uh, other fields that are growing vegetable crops. And, and that is something to consider. So, you know, as I mentioned, I think there's a lot of opportunities on our farms to, to make improvements. Right. And so we've got facilities now that have emissions in, in more concentrated and, and mechanized flows. Um, and then we also have just facilities that um, could be improved. And I'll talk about some of these um, opportunities next. So, you know, I wanna start with farm hygiene. I, sp I spend a lot of time doing applied research on farms and I've seen all different, all different things. Um, but one thing I, I never love seeing is a mess, right? And I think some of these farms could do a lot better job just essentially picking up their poop. And I think that could do a lot to reduce odor, um, improve image to the public, um, and also make some of our workspaces a lot safer, um, reducing some of the, the air emissions associated with them. Um, so, you know, some of these solid liquid separation facilities and some of these tanks that are inside spaces um, really become hazardous when manure spilled and left unkept. Um, I think creates some risk for our workers, but again, has has real impacts on our um, air quality. The other thing I see a lot of is um, manure or, you know, TMR, you know, total mixed rations that spill out into these drip areas at the edge of barns. And so then you're you're getting, you know, this area is wet. And I think these can be real sources of, of odor too. And um, I think I've been seeing a lot of improvements with new facilities, um, you know, being more mindful of that. I'm also a strong advocate for us to start really considering gutters and, and better managing rainwater on some of these facilities. Um, so I mentioned TMR a little bit, as far as volatile organics and, and odor goes, um, total mixed rations can be a really big source. Um, so on the left, you know, I, I'm showcasing here a couple of, I think, great examples of what we can be doing. And this is a new feed center that a dairy put in in New York. Um, and the reason they put it in was to actually reduce shrink, right, to save money. And there's not a ton of literature out there, but um, I have seen estimates of up to 60 cents a cow a day in losses in some of these feed concentrates due to wind and blowing, blowing the scoop of, of grain out of the bucket. Uh, this farm thought that they were losing upwards of 25% of some of their purchased materials and so really invested in this nice feeding center. On the right is an image of a facility I, I've recently toured um, in Germany. 
Um, over there, a lot of the new facilities are required to pave and to do so in a way that contains TMR um, and diverts clean rainwater. Um, and so this really helps them keep their farm clean, keep this TMR out of the gravel driveways and really reduce odor and, and particulate matter. Uh, I just mentioned paving and, and, and I see differences when I'm on farms, right? So I see gravel driveways and this is from this spring, right? We've had kind of a, an early jump on the year here, um, but truck traffic going in and out of these gravel driveways can really kick up quite a bit of particulate matter. Um, and on you know the center here, you see a paved area. This is a pretty high, high um, traffic area. You've got a feed center, barns, manure systems behind me. And as vehicles go past, um, we, we see minimal amounts of dust. Um, I also think just getting, you know, if encouraging farms and their and their employees to slow down a little. Um, here I am out at a remote storage and we had some tankers behind tractors coming in at high speeds and you just see tremendous amounts of dust getting kicked up by these facilities uh, by, by, by that action. All right, so on dairies, we've we've encouraged for several decades to you know store manure, and, and that's been a great way for us to improve the way we manage these nutrients and better protect water quality, um, help these farms recycle those nutrients to the croplands in, in the right way and in the right time. And as a result, though, the, these storages can become kind of a source of odors and a source of methane because they're typically anaerobic. Um, and also be a source of ammonia emissions. A few things that farms can do um, are really just to contain them. So instead of an open air manure pit where manure is splashing in, you can you can build a shed around that building and put a roof on. And, and just that, that roof structure has um, been shown to really reduce some of these ammonia emissions, um, partly because it's keeping them out of the, the heat of the sun and a little less microbial activity. It's preventing the wind from kind of going across the surface and, and kicking up those gases. Um, another thing, um, maybe easier with some of our uh, facilities that have high solids content, but is to encourage crust formation on the manure storages. So a natural crust is known to really reduce ammonia emissions. Um, although when crusts do get too big, they can have some impact on nitrous oxide. Um, there are other additives to promote crust formation um, that have been out there, and there's been a couple of nice reviews on this. They do have kind of an intermittent impact on methane, um, and I think there's a lot of work to be done in that area on how we, we might strategize ways to, to manage methane better from these pits. Solid liquid separation, I would say, is growing in... Um, in use in the Northeast and is pretty common on especially some of our larger dairy facilities. Um, many of these farms are using screw presses in our region because with the cold climate, some of the more passive separation systems don't work. Um, and, you know, it really gives farms a great opportunity to recycle those, those solids as bedding, which can be a huge cost saver. Um, there's you know, as a result of separation, you, you have kind of two different manure streams to now manage. You've got separated liquids and separated solids. And this graph in the middle from a recent review by Zhang um, kind of shows how the emissions, you know, partition depending on which, which source or, or which stream you're talking about, um, with more of the ammonia emissions being affiliated with the liquids, same with the methane. Um, more of the nitrous oxide emissions being associated with a, a pile of separated solids. Um, but the screw press separation itself can be really good um, for a greenhouse gas perspective because you're you're keeping solids, volatile solids out of a manure storage. Uh, so as a result, you can you kind of reduce your total greenhouse gas emissions. And then basically the the more effective your separation process is and the more fine, solids you're able to capture. So if you could afford to invest in a centrifuge, for instance, you can further reduce down your, your relative greenhouse gas emissions. These systems don't seem to have any major impact on ammonia emissions, however. A few more things about separated solids. Um, and these, I would say, are, are more my experience in the field. Um, but we have a lot of farms in addition to just separating solids for bedding that are um, incorporating lime as a way to kind of 
do a quick pasteurization of the material before it's used as bedding. And those facilities can generate substantial amounts of, of ammonia, um, even I would say some, some levels that are quite hazardous to farm employees. Um, I've also seen a lot of these solid liquid separator, separators um, generating solids into a three-sided shed. And then, you know, as the winds blow, they're just drawing the solids out and kind of dispersing them through the air. So again, if, if the interest is to, to recycle this material as bedding, you've got a huge shrink problem here, but you also are, are generating, you know, a, a, a dust and bioaerosol issue. So you can, you can increase particulate matter um, aff affiliated with these systems if, if you're not managing them well. Anaerobic digesters are another technology that's really, um, I would say, well established in New York, and we're seeing a lot of growing interest, especially trying to enter some of these renewable natural gas markets. Um, there was a really uh, nice paper that came out in 2019 that did some life cycle analysis and looked at the effect of anaerobic digestion on greenhouse gas and ammonia emissions, and then looked at um, the impact of solid liquid separation, and then the two of them coupled, which is, I would say, common. Uh, the green diamond here is basically your total greenhouse gas or your total ammonia emissions. And you can see that <clears throat> digesters can substantially drop down greenhouse gas emissions, um, solid liquid separators being almost more effective, right? And then combined um, some, some good effects there, but, you know, maybe driven more by solid liquid separation than AD, um, but again, a benefit from both. Um, with anaerobic digestion, um, you can have some reductions in, in ammonia, but uh, sometimes you can have losses because the, the process itself can, can reduce that nitrogen in a form that's a little more volatile. Um, the reason a lot of New York farms started to do digestion really was as an odor mitigation technique though. And there, there have been papers that have really demonstrated significant odor reductions with this material versus a raw manure. Um, some considerations for digesters. Um, we have farms that are really um, starting to utilize more food waste and co-digesting manure and food waste. Uh, the food waste can be really a uh, val value to the farm for a tipping fee. Um, we're diverting organics out of landfills. That's a good thing. And we're generating a lot more renewable energy when we digest those materials. But how that food waste is handled can be a significant source of odors. Um, also can make some slippery concrete pads. Um, we've got our engine gen sets on some farms generating renewable electricity. Um, some are equipped with catalytic converters, but that's not a requirement in New York state. Um, and so we, we can have emissions associated with actually a stack. Um, we've have flares, right? So the flares combusting the methane when the, the biogas usage systems can't handle it. There's can be some emissions associated with those. Um, I've been at some digestate storages that are quite lively um, with bubbles and foam from the active methanogens in there. Um, these waves here aren't from manure spilling in. They're actually from the air just pushing foam around. It kind of looked like a tidal area. Um, and then as more and more farms are getting into renewable natural gas, the actual upgrading systems associated with that that are separating the CO2 from the biogas can also generate methane. And um, in addition to our, our emissions work, we're also doing some leak to testing from biogas systems. It's really led by my colleague, Lauren Ray. And we've got a camera that can image these gases. And so here you can actually visualize methane leaving a vent that is supposed to be mostly CO2. Um, this is sort of a, a high res setting that makes the picture jump, but enables you to really see that methane plume better. Um, it is recognized that there is a small percentage of methane there. Um, but again, we're, we're trying not to, to lose the, that valuable gas. Cover and flare systems. Uh, I would say New York State is, is quite interested in this as a, a mitigation option for um, and, and not just methane and, and mitigation, but also really a climate resiliency option. Um, so you can see fresh water on top of these. The idea here is these covers not only capture gas and can and send them to a flare, so you're really reducing your or your methane, um, but you're also diverting rainwater and keeping it out of a manure storage and you know retaining that capacity for the manure and, and not 
losing it during large rain events. Uh, these covers significantly reduce odors um, and are known to retain a lot more nitrogen in the in the manure and so limiting ammonia emissions. Um, I should say, especially some of these early generation covers aren't perfect and some of our gas emissions work has been out and we found some leaks. The nice thing about these systems is, um, you know, this plastic can be re-welded and fixed. So if there are leaks um, that we, we help the farms identify, those things can be repaired and um, that gas can be captured and flared. And there are new covers um, going in all around the state and the designs have improved. There's actually a standard for the manufacturing of the materials now. Um, they've moved from these greens to these black materials that are a lot more UV resistant. Um, they've improved some of the means by which you get manure in and out and manage water on top. Um, so I think we're excited about these technologies. Um, it is important to note that this is an expensive engineered solution, right? And isn't really practical for all farms. Um, another solution that is out there, and, and these are my last couple of slides, um, are, are really biofilters. So I think, you know, this group has, has heard and talked about biofilters a lot in the past, um, but I think there's still a lot of opportunity with these technologies. Um, this is a system that is installed at a digester plant um, in New York that is um, not only managing manure, but is managing a lot of food waste. So they've got these tanks in the back, these reception pits that have manure um, and food waste. They're drawing the air off of there, keeping kind of a, you know, a vacuum on the tank and drawing any odorous emissions up through this pipe, feeding them down into the biofilter um, where naturally immobilized bacteria and fungi are in there, basically eating up these odorous gases. Um, and then that um, is drawn through with a blower and exhausted to the air. Biofilters are known to have substantial reductions of odor, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia. Um, and we've also seen some intermittent methane reductions. I've, I've done some work um, trying to better manage these um, filters to improve methane capture. I think there's a lot of opportunity there. And there are some groups around the country that have some funding now to really focus in on this methane biofiltration. Um, here's another couple of examples of biofilters. Um, the one on the left is actually treating a, a manure pit from a, uh, a dairy barn. And the one on the right is drawing air out of a manure uh, treatment building. Um, again, these, these concrete sides really facilitate media exchange and are kind of some improved designs over some of the early open beds. Um, I, again, I think there a lot, there's a lot of opportunity and in, in these systems, I think, would be a lot more scalable, lower cost to some of our, our smaller producers. Um, so that's all I have. Again, Jason Prodairy, I'm happy to, to answer any questions.